First of all, thank you to Irina um, and everyone here at ITU for hosting us and for coming to this talk. Um, it's really great to see all of you, even though we don't know you yet. Um, and really inspiring talks by Allison and Alessandro. So that was a great way to start. Um, so I'm Annalie from CIAD, the Copenhagen Institute of Interaction Design. And um, our role in VERT-EU is to translate the insight, insights that are gained by our amazing research team um, into practical tools and potentially interactive applications that will be relevant to developer communities um, through methods like co-design workshops and stakeholder workshops, as well as speculative design and iterative prototyping um, together with developers. So today, um, I'd like to kind of take a bit of a step back and talk about how little details become big in regards to design, ethics, and connected devices. Um, so I'll start with thinking through the role of design and gathering these three words together. Um, and then look at a spectrum of illustrative examples that might help us think about um, speculative design in the context of ethics. Um, and then end by wondering what next, and hopefully have some discussion with all of you about that. So perhaps when you see the two words, design and devices together, um, you think about the skin of IoT devices. So what, yeah, okay, chrome or white or mahogany uh, as your choices for the beautiful glowing orb that you're gonna have in your living room. Um, or perhaps when you think about design and ethics together, you start to immediately think, especially in the context of today, about those checkboxes or the terms and conditions um, that you don't read. So I think that these elements are definitely part of the picture. Um, and they're the forward-facing user interfaces are absolutely crucial um, for us to understand what we can and cannot control in these applications. Um, but I think we should take a moment to reflect about what happens on the other side of the devices um, and the role of the developers as they create those initial bones, muscles, and the pulsing energy of the IoT devices. So here we can acknowledge, actually, the potential of unlocking more awareness and knowledge about ethical decision making from that first seed of the product design, as opposed to all the way at the end, where you might tack on your after the fact, um, beautifully designed user interface, which is absolutely crucial also. But let's take a moment now today and think about the first seed and how do we, how do we take an ethical approach from the very first step. Um, so as I was saying, um, how do, how would developers actually decide in the first place what those seemingly little details of technical infrastructure within an IoT device are and how accessible they will be for users um, and how much control they think users should have or not? Um, are they entirely embedded inside of a product management process which they can't even take a step outside of and question. Um, these are some of the initial first questions that we'll be considering when we go in and talk to and look at these developer communities, um, whether on online forums or in person. But then once those details are chosen, how do they become potentially big details or even glaring holes if we're not aware of their implications? Mm, I think that in the case of these developers and designers that we're thinking about, and I should say, I think 
that's many of us right here, standing or sitting in this room. Um, it's not just a kind of us and them, here I am and here they are kind of situation. So maybe I'll start saying we in the future. But um, sometimes it can be even difficult to start thinking about these ethical dimensions um, and to even have a toehold and wonder what the next toehold might be when we plot out what implications there are for the devices that we're designing. So what kind of tools um, could we create that might help designers and developers to get through that process and figure out what the implications are from step to step, toehold to toehold, as they make these apps or tools or devices? Um, how can we empower developers and set them up to think critically about what they're making? And I think that here's where we posit in EU that design has another role to play. Um, it's beyond the traditional approach of, let's say, just graphic design or product design from a kind of finalizing the concept point of view. Um, in this case, we're taking a turn down a branch of speculative design. Um, and we're going to try to create some artifacts and some situations and some experiences and workshops that will help participants think divergently and think differently about the future. Um, so we might build those out in current technology, but we will free ourselves a little bit from the constraints of, let's say, the business requirements of a day-to-day um, of a day-to-day -day product as you are making them. And this diagram is from um, James Auger, and it's about alternative presence and speculative futures. So we have um, basically everyday life and, and real products available on the market in the center, but then we also have technologies which are further and further uh, advanced and farther from our here and now. And we have to think about how we might bring them down into our here and now, and what role they will have for our future. So at this point, I want to look at a couple of examples, which either go from mm, wondering and making us think about our power in terms of collecting information, our awareness, um, in terms of both being developers or designers in this world. And then finally, some really direct takes on how ethics um, have a part in these devices. So this is the transparency grenade by Julian Oliver um, in 2014. And it's a tool for more corporate and governmental transparency to actively leak all the information at a private meeting um, by capturing the network traffic and audio at a given location and then streaming it to a server where images, usernames, and voice are extracted and presented. So this to me raises questions like, yeah, given that we could, would we and should we? When we look at something like this, um, this is a series of posters called Think Privacy by Adam Harvey, done last year in 2015. And this one says, mind the cyber things, and then kind of underneath, devices connected to the internet may betray you. And artist Adam Harvey brings attention to issues around data, privacy, and surveillance. Um, specifically thinking in this case, do we maybe need to update our public safety announcements? Um, are cyber things as strong as machines? So he's hijacking a familiar aesthetic from um, the safety <coughs> caution signs that you might see around a workshop. And actually, he was seeing it around his workshop in his, uh, in his workspace. And he said this was great advice when placed next to a drill press. Um, but heavy machinery safety is no longer a daily concern for me. And privacy is. Another project by Adam Harvey back in 2010 called CV Dazzle. Um, and it's a type of camouflage from computer vision. So it uses 
makeup to create bold patterning on your face that will break apart um, features that are expected by computer vision algorithms. And to me, this one begs the question of, yeah, what does it mean if we have to engage in self-defense against the devices that we ourselves are creating? Um, and what does the information asymmetry have in terms of implications for, for, the, yeah, for our daily lives and the grocery stores that we're passing through, let's say? And this leads me to more direct tools uh, about speculation. And this is called Speculative Supply by Charles Gideon, um, done just this past fall in 2016. And it's, it, in and of itself, actually, a bit of a speculation um, to create a text editor that would actively help you support thinking and writing about alternatives. Um, and Charlie's putting together a series of tools um, that will hopefully help anyone speculate about the future implications of whether uh, an event or a product. Um, can we support people to hypothesize and speculate about the directions events can take? And what tools might they need during that speculative thinking and writing and editing process? Um, in case we needed more help imagining while using Charlie's tool, let's say, um, there's this uh, speculative hacking kind of work being done. In this case, um, hacking smart guns. So many of you may have seen this already, but um, in this case, the hacker is changing the trajectory of the rifle's bullet uh, after it's been shot so that um, the bullet flies 2.5 feet to the left. Um, in the next example, we have um, hacking cars. And this is the Jeep Cherokee experiment. So um, Miller and Valsak were able to entirely command the Jeep's entertainment system, dashboard functions, steerings, brakes, and transmissions. And again, here I think that examples like these are more about hacking as a form of speculation as much as they are about yeah, giving feedback to companies or showing um, the rest of the world kind of this fear-mongering issue of you can do this, this is possible. It's also part of, for, our, for us right now, having, yeah, most of us already seen a lot of these type of scenarios. Um, how do we take this and then consider, yeah, what, how it makes you start to think? how it makes you start to speculate about what you are designing today. Um, this project goes even more into that same vein. So it's called Ethical Autonomous Vehicles by Mathieu Cherubini. And um, I don't think there's too much sound for it. It's OK. No, there's not sound for it. Yeah. But it shows how driverless cars might behave in a simulated environment when confronted with various ethical scenarios um, or dilemmas. And so each behavior of the um, cars corresponds to a certain behavior uh, setup as well as a certain ethical principle. And he begs the question, could you purchase a set of ethical values that would go with your smart car? Um, depending on your taste or religious beliefs. And he pushes us to really think about how autonomous vehicles will need to consider those complexities of moral and ethical reasoning, because they will be confronted with unpredictable situations that have a huge effect on your daily life. And this is already back in 2014. Um, so. Hopefully, he's gotten a job at some of, these, uh, some of these autonomous car companies. And he also has done a, some incredible uh, heavy lifting in terms of creating these complex diagrams um, where he looks at um, things like, if, um, if I'm buying, let's say, purchasing the protector set of ethical guidelines, um, the car will focus on the safety of the driver and the passenger no matter what. 
And um, how, how might he translate that to the operating system within a car? Um, by the way, I have tweeted, and I'll give you a, a link later to all these projects, so you can take a more look at these diagrams, because they're pretty amazing. Another project, again, by Mathieu, is called Open Source Ethics for Autonomous Surgical Robots. And in this case, he wonders um, if a company man manufactured this uh, surgical robot, the, um, the software would probably be closed. But what if it were open source? Um, what if you could potentially define the way that autonomous surgical robot acts based on your, um, let's say, religious values or um, however else you have made your ethical map of personal values. Um, so here we see what would happen if a um, Jehovah Witness uh, were confronted with the ethical autonomous uh, surgical robots. Um, so they refuse blood transmission and the hackers in this case would develop a module on top of the software that would forbid the robot to um, perform that blood transfusion. And again, so here I think it's kind of a moment to take a step and say, all right, we know that smart cars and smart rifles and robots for surgery clearly confront us with you know, glaring ethical problems and life and death black and white situations. Um, but what about the kind of more murky moments um, of, let's say, the, the domestic environment um, where you have your coffee machine connected to the internet, you have your body connected to the internet in some way or another. What are the different questions that it might bring up? What are the scenarios that you start to think about? Um, and Simone Redodengo writes really thoughtfully about this. So he says, what about the more mundane and insignificant objects of our everyday lives? Smart objects might also need to have moral capacities, as they know too much about their surroundings, to take a neutral stance. So um, yeah, with fields like home automation, ambient intelligence, um, objects of our daily lives will have access to so much data about us and the environment around us that they will also need to and be taking decisions on our um, on our part. And this uh, next project, Ethical Objects, is a really fantastic exploration of this notion. So, no. Should play. Mm. So it says religion, atheist, education, basic. Age, zero to 20. <coughs> Sex, both. Found in Kathmandu, Nepal, actually. Uh, one response. So answer one, focus on the thinner person and give them the fan. 
Because I do not really, oh, yeah, it's, it's tough. Because I do not really like fat people and I think that they should be punished. Something like that. <laughs> this is live crowdsourced data decided by the Mechanical Turk worker. So I think that a project like this is just, I mean, it's, it's pretty brutally opening up um, a lot of these questions that we're wondering about today and wondering about Invert EU and wondering about um, in regards to how we can design our objects such that they might potentially enact ethics that we believe in um, or engage with ethics in general and ethical decision making. And it's a light, I mean, he, uh, he kept it kind of light in his own way in the shooting of the video, but it's a really tricky issue. And he also goes into um, this detailed diagramming like Mathieu did. They, this is a collaboration between the two of them, um, where he explains not only exactly how the algorithm works within the fan that decides who gets the air, um, but also by diagramming things so explicitly, he opens it up for us, again, to, to take that to the table as a tool, as we p potentially develop or design or work on some initial concepts about connected products and the role that they will play in our domestic uh, lives or, yeah, potentially public lives as well. So again, yeah, what, what tools and experiences can we set up to empower developers and designers to think critically about their practice and about their innovations, um, to imagine the, the bigness of each detail that they compose? And to what end? Um, so critical design and speculative design, as I'm sure many of you know, takes a lot of inspiration from science fiction. Um, and I think that a lot of the questions that we wonder about um, push, they push us and they push um, the objects around us in terms of the possible role they could play. So dogs are smartphones. <laughs> and um, Neil Gaiman, the intentions of a tool are what it does. A hammer intends to strike, a vice intends to hold fast, a lever intends to lift. They are what it is made for. But sometimes a tool may have other uses that you don't know. Sometimes in doing what you intend, you also do what the knife intends without knowing. And I think that beyond these, some of the projects that I've shown you today, there's also kind of more simple and, you know, uh, just analog ways that we can illustrate and have conversations about these topics that are really difficult. So we could take, um, in this case, this is the Networks Land Project by Surya Matu and Ingrid Burrington. And they developed a set of curriculum for kindergartners to understand, better understand how computers connect to the Wi-Fi, connect to each other, connect to a router, connect to the physical infrastructure in our cities. Um, and how at any one of those different connection points, data could or could not be accessed. Um, so if we have these physical objects on the table with us, and we have those videos that we were looking at just before, um, maybe we could start to have a conversation among extremely different experts and actors who all have valid voices to bring to the table. And, um, I think that in Vert EU, we're definitely hoping to open outside of the traditional boundaries of each one of our fields, whether design or ethics or privacy or law, um, and come together to create an environment with developers, with designers, to, again, together, think about what settings could be set 
um, and where decision making is still open in regards to virtue ethics. So that's it. Um, I have a bunch of references that were all part of the presentation and um, either you can grab them at that little bit.ly or go ahead on Twitter and you'll find us. Um, but thank you. Thank you very much.